Shall we pray? Father in heaven, as we open your holy book, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit to open our minds and hearts to receive your message. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Before we can understand the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70, we need to understand the first destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in the year 586 B.C. But we need to go even further back to the establishment of Israel as God's covenant people at the time of the Exodus. Israel was at the foot of Mount Sinai, and God offered to make a covenant with them. Let's read about this in Exodus 19 and verses 4 through 8. God is speaking to Moses. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And then God says to Moses, These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. God is offering to make a covenant with Israel. And he says, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my special people. It continues. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. So it's laid before the elders. Then the elders lay it before the people. And we notice in verse 8, Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. In other words, we accept the offer of the covenant. And then Moses relays the message back to God. It says, So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. Now God also asked Israel to build a tabernacle in the wilderness so that he could dwell in their midst. We find this in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8, where it says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. When the tabernacle was finished, the glorious Shekinah presence of God entered the tabernacle. We read this in Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 and 35. It says there, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. A little later, Israel entered the promised land. Actually, it was 40 years later, but uh, compared to the time frame that we're speaking of, it was a short period of time. 40 years later, Israel entered the promised land and eventually, Solomon built a solid temple for the Lord. It was no longer a tabernacle that could be torn down and transported. And when the temple was finished, God once again entered the temple as the Shekinah glory. We find that in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. It says there, And it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. God wanted to dwell among His people, and He wanted His people to be faithful to the covenant and obey His voice. However, 800 years of apostasy followed after the Shekinah entered the tabernacle in the wilderness. In 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 14 through verse, verse 16, we find a description of the unfaithfulness of Israel to the covenant. We find there these words, Moreover, all the leaders of the priests and all the people transgressed more and more according to all the abominations, don't forget that word, according to all the abominations of the nations, and defiled the house of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. However, 
They mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. So the people transgressed the covenant. They disobeyed God. They practiced the abominations of the nations, and they mocked the messengers of God, and they scoffed at the prophets of the Lord. Israel became a harlot, practicing the abominations of the surrounding nations. By the way, this is not happening among the pagan nations. This is happening among God's own professed people, those who claim to serve the true God. We find in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 15, and then verses 22 and verse 30, how Israel apostatized from the Lord. It says there in verse, actually, we'll begin with verse 21. But you trusted in your own beauty, played the harlot because of your fame, and poured out your harlotry on everyone passing by who would have it. And now comes the key word. And in all your abominations and acts of harlotry, you did not remember the days of your youth, and it speaks figuratively, when you were naked and bare, struggling in your blood. How degenerate is your heart, says the Lord God. See you do all these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot. Notice that God's people had become a harlot. They were practicing the abominations of the surrounding nations, and these were those who had professed to ent enter into a covenant with the Lord. The prophet Ezekiel in chapter 16, verse 2, once again repeats that the people were committing the abominations of the nations. This is what made Israel the harlot. We find there in Ezekiel 16, verse 2, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. Jeremiah and Ezekiel both speak about abominations in Jerusalem. Jeremiah prophesied before the first uh, siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, and Ezekiel was then taken to Babylon, and he prophesied there in Babylon. So they are within this historical context of the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in the year 586. And so because of Israel's harlotry, and because of practicing the abominations of the nations, God came to judge the people in Jerusalem and Israel in the entire realm. We find in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 4 that God came from the north to judge his people. We find in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 4 these words, Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north. That's heaven. That's where God lives. The sides of the north, according to Psalm 48, is where God lives. So it says, Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it, and radiating out of its midst, midst like the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. You see, God was now coming to judge Jerusalem, which is really a word that represents all of Israel, all of God's chosen people at that time. Ezekiel chapter 8 is called the abominations chapter. The reason why is because God shows Ezekiel an abomination that is being committed among God's professed people. And Ezekiel thinks, oh, that's terrible. God says, you haven't seen anything yet. I'll show you a greater abomination than this. And the process goes on. And the chapter ends with the greatest abomination that was being committed among those who professed to be his own people. We find in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 16 through 18, the culminating abomination that was being committed. I'm going to read beginning with verse 16. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were worshiping the sun toward the east. The worst abomination 
was practicing sun worship. I want you to remember all of these details. Verse 17, then he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the, notice the word again, abominations that they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, I also will act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. So they were practicing the abominations, the idolatry of the nations. The greatest of them was turning their backs to the temple of the Lord and worshiping the Son God. Now, how did the people fall into this condition? It was because of their leaders. Notice Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 31. Remember, the prophet Jeremiah lived before Daniel and his friends were taken to Babylon. In the first stage of the captivity, there were three stages, 605, 597, and 586. Jeremiah 531 reads, Then the prophets, the prophets, rather, prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. However, what will you do in the end? So notice the problem was that the prophets prophesied falsely. The priests ruled by their own power. The people were not guiltless because it says, and my people love to have it so. They surrounded themselves with priests and with prophets who told them what they wanted to hear. So God promised that destruction was going to come upon the four corners of the land. This is found in Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, son of man, thus says the Lord God to the land of Israel, an end. The end has come upon the four corners of the land. Don't forget that, four corners of the land. All of these details we will meet again later on when we speak about the second destruction of Jerusalem and the final destruction of the world. So it says, once again, an end. The end has come upon the four corners of the land. Now the end has come upon you, and I will send my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways, and I will repay you for all your, here's the word again, for all your abomination. However, not everyone in the city was on, in apostasy. There were some faithful people within the city of Jerusalem. In other words, there were two groups. Those who were truly faithful and those who were practicing the abominations of the nations. And so before the destruction came, it was necessary to do a work of separation, to separate the righteous from the unrighteous, to separate the sun worshipers from those who worshiped the Creator God. You see, in Jerusalem, there was a people within the people. There was a small, faithful remnant within the city. I want you to remember this. I'll get ahead of myself a little bit. The book of Revelation. You also have a group that sigh and cry. It's in Revelation chapter 18. Because of the abominations that the harlot of Revelation 17 is committing. And then we're going to notice that destruction is coming for the, from the four corners of the earth. And we're also going to notice that it's a sealing work that takes place on the forehead before the destruction comes. Revelation picks up on what we're talking about here. I want, you to read, I want you to read with me Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, where we find the description of the judgment of separation of those who worship the Creator from those who worship the Son God. Ezekiel 9, verses 1 through 7. Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice, saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. And suddenly six men, came from the direction of the upper gate which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side 
And the Lord said to him, now comes the judgment of separation. See, before the destruction, there's going to be a separation of the sun worshipers from those who worship the Creator. So it says, once again, verse 4, And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, that is where God's professed people were, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. Notice once again the key word, abomination. Verse 5, To the others he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary, that is with the leaders. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Then he said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and killed the city. But something happened before this took place. I just read this passage because I want you to see that before the destruction took place, before God poured out his wrath, there was a sealing work where a seal or a mark was placed on the forehead to separate the righteous from the unrighteous so that when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city, the righteous would survive the destruction. Just like in the book of Revelation, the 144,000 will survive the final destruction. Before the city was destroyed, the Shekinah that had entered the temple now departed from the temple. Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 18 and 19 describes the departure of the Shekinah. You see, in chapter 1, God, the glory of God, is coming from heaven, from the north, to enter the temple to perform a work of judgment. When that work of judgment is over, then the Shekinah is going to leave the temple desolate. Notice Ezekiel 10, 18 and 19. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. The cherubim lifted their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels were beside them, and they stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. So now they've left the sanctuary at the east gate of the temple. And then the glory leaves the temple and lingers for a few moments upon the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. Notice chapter 11, verses 22 and 23 of the book of Ezekiel. It says, Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them. And the glory of the God of Israel was high above them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city. In other words, it's left, the Shekinah has left the temple. And now it's going to stand for a few moments on the Mount of Olives east of the city. It says in verse 23, And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain which was on the east side of the city. So now the city has been forsaken. The Shekinah has left the temple and the abominations will now lead to the desolation of the city by Nebuchadnezzar. But I want you to notice that there's a sealing. When the sealing is finished, the Shekinah leaves the temple, lingers at the east gate, then leaves and lingers on the Mount of Olives, then goes back to heaven. And the city is now forsaken, and the abominations will lead to desolation. So who was it that came against the city of Jerusalem? It was actually King Nebuchadnezzar. And do you know that the Bible describes Nebuchadnezzar coming like an eagle to destroy the city? Let's read several verses that portray ancient Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar as coming as an eagle to destroy the city. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 13. It says, Behold, he shall come up like clouds, and his chariots like a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are plundered. Lamentations, chapter 4 and verse 19. Once again, by the way, Lamentations was sung when uh, the Jews were being taken captive from the city of Jerusalem to Babylon, 
and to the dispersion. In fact, the book of Lamentations is written in what is known as Kina meter. Kina meter was a literary style that was used in funeral dirges. And so the book of Lamentations was written by Jeremiah as the Jews were being taken captive to Babylon. They were crying out as they sang this song. Notice Lamentations 4, verse 19. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles of heaven. Notice once again, the Babylonian armies that destroyed Jerusalem are compared to eagles. They pursued us on the mountains and lay in wait for us in the wilderness. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 8, once again, compares the invasion of Babylon with the coming of an eagle. It says, their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. I can't help but mention here Matthew chapter 24, verse 28, where it says that where the carcass is, there are the eagles gathered together. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. I want you to start thinking about typology. What happened will happen again. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 4, in fact, Babylon is compared to a lion with eagle's wings. It says there in Daniel chapter 7, verse 4, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And for those who excavated the ancient city of Babylon, they found at the entrances sphinxes of lions with eagle's wings. So uh, the conquest of Nebuchadnezzar of the city, because of its abominations, is compared to an eagle. Now, the city, when it was besieged by uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, suffered from three separate scourges or punishments. Notice Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 24. Jeremiah 32, verse 24. Look, the siege mounts. They have come to the city to take it. And the city has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans who fought against it. And now notice the three punishments. Because of the sword, that would mean war, and famine, and pestilence. These are the very three things that are mentioned in Matthew chapter 24 with regards to the second destruction of Jerusalem. Now, I want you to notice 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verses 17 through 21, where the actual destruction of the city is described. It says, therefore, he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men. This reminds us of Ezekiel 9, very similar terminology. Who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the ages or the weak, aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand, and all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. They burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. In other words, after the destruction of Jerusalem, there was a period of time in which the city remained desolate. You know, Flavius Josephus actually tells us that the book of Lamentations was sung as the people were agonizing over the destruction of the city and they were being taken captive. Now, I want you to notice also in Jeremiah 25, that the abominations that God's people were committing led to desolation. You remember that in Matthew 24, you have the abomination of desolation. The abomination is a sign. It's a sign that desolation or destruction is coming. I want you to notice Jeremiah 25. We'll read verses 8 and 9, and then we'll read verses 11, and we'll jump to verse 18. It says in Jeremiah 25, verse 8, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north. This is talking about um, 
Babylon, because Babylon came to the Holy Land from the north. So therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpe and perpetual, notice the word, desolations. Verse 11, and this whole land shall be a, key word again, desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Verse 18, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, its kings and its princes, to make them, here's the key word again, a desolation, an astonishment, a hissing, and a curse as it is in this day. So you notice, God comes from the north to judge Jerusalem. When he judges Jerusalem, he places a mark on the foreheads of those who sigh and cry because of the abominations that are being committed. These are God worshipers, the worshipers of the Creator. On the other hand, you have those individuals who are worshiping the sun. They are the wicked within the city. And then the Shekinah leaves, goes to the east gate of the sanctuary, then goes and lingers on Mount, the Mount of Olives, and then goes off to heaven. The city is now abandoned of the glory of God. The city is now ready for desolation. Because of the abominations, now the city will suffer desolation. Now, why was this going to happen? It's because they did not listen to the voice of the true prophets. We find in Jeremiah chapter 25, in verses 3 and 4, you see the false prophets, if you read Jeremiah, they were saying, oh, there's not going to be any destruction. God is with this city. Don't listen to what these prophets are saying. Jeremiah, you know, Jeremiah ended up in the dungeon. They hated him. His book was burned, and so on. Notice what it says in Jeremiah 25 and verses 3 and 4. From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, this is the twenty-third year in which the word of the Lord has come to me. And I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, God says to his people, but you have not listened. And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear. Now, there's another thing that we need to take a look at before we talk about the restoration of Israel after the captivity. One of the main reasons why this city was destroyed is because the people were desecrating the Holy Sabbath. In fact, the main reason why the city was destroyed is because they were trampling upon God's Holy Sabbath. You say, well, where does the Bible say that? Jeremiah chapter 17. We'll read verses 24 and 25, and then we'll go to verse 27. God says to his people, And it shall be, if you heed me carefully, says the Lord, to bring no burden to the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day. That means sanctify the Sabbath day. To do no work in it. Then shall enter the gates of this city kings and princes sitting on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, accompanied by men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever. God is saying, if you keep the Sabbath, if you hallow the Sabbath, the city is going to remain forever. But there's the other side of the coin, verse 27. But if you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. Then I will kindle fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. In other words, the trampling on the Sabbath was one of the main reasons for the destruction of Jerusalem. After the captivity, Nehemiah had to rebuke uh, the Jews once again because they were doing what they did before the captivity that led to the destruction of Jerusalem. Notice Nehemiah chapter 13 verses 15 through 18. Here Nehemiah writes, in those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath. They were working on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. 
And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Men of Tyre dwelt there also, who brought fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What evil thing is this that you do, by which you profane the Sabbath day? And then he, he goes back and he talks about the reason for the captivity. Did not your fathers do thus? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. How interesting the Sabbath is involved. Now, the captivity was only going to last for a period of 70 years. By the way, this begins in 605 and ends in the year 536 BC. I want to read that in Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, where Daniel understood that the desolation of Jerusalem was going to last a period of 70 years. It says there in Daniel 9, verse 1 and 2, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So the desolation of Jerusalem was going to last for a period of 70 years. And then prophecy said, that God was going to restore Israel to their land. They would rebuild the temple, they would rebuild the wall, they would rebuild the city, and they would reestablish their civil and religious government. In other words, they would be restored and they would be given another chance. But Daniel also prophesied that there would be a second apostasy, second abominations, that would lead to a second desolation and destruction of the city of Jerusalem. This is described in Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 to 27, which I'm going to read now. And once again, you have the key words, abominations and desolate. This is speaking not about the first destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, but the second destruction of Jerusalem by another pagan general by the name of Titus with the Roman legions. It says there, in Daniel 9, verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. After the 62 weeks, that uh, it's understood that it's after the 62 and the 7, which is 69, and we use the year-day principle, 69 weeks is 483 years. In other words, after 483 years, the Messiah will, be co will come. And then it says in verse 26, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And then it speaks about a second destruction of Jerusalem. It says, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. This is not the first destruction. This is the second destruction. So it says here, the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, who are the people of the prince? The people of the prince are the Jews. Who is the prince? The prince is Jesus. Now you say, wait a minute. You're saying that the Jews, uh, the, the people of the prince, in other words, the people of Jesus, the Jews, would destroy their own city and sanctuary? Yes. I wish I had time to go into this and prove from Scripture that really God destroyed Jerusalem for the second time. But there are also texts that says that God sent his armies. This is a parable in uh, Matthew chapter 22. And then we are told also that because of the sins and abominations of the Jews, they brought destruction upon their own city. So it's God using armies to destroy those who had broken the covenant. It continues saying, verse. Uh, 26 again, after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it, that is the city and the sanctuary, shall be with a flood. And until the end of the war, here's the key word, 
desolations are determined. Verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. This is week number 70. And in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. This is the death of Christ that ended the sacrificial system. And now notice the key words. Verse 27 again. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes what? Desolate. Here you have abomination, desolation. So this is speaking about the Roman armies. It says, shall come one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, which is determined, is poured out on the, and here's the key word again, desolate. So after uh, the restoration of Jerusalem and of the Jewish nation, after the captivity, there was going to be a period of 490 years where grace was going to be given to the Jewish nation to um, shape up, if we might say, and they would not. And so finally, Destruction would come upon the city because of the abominations for a second time. Let's read 2 Chronicles 36, 22, and 23, where we have the command to rebuild the temple by Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. So Cyrus is saying, go back to your land and rebuild your temple. The temple where the Shekinah had left uh, sometime before. So now a second temple is built. By the way, the second temple was finished in the year 515 BC. It took a period of about five years to rebuild the temple. Now, when the temple was finished, it was not even the shadow of what the temple built by Solomon was like. In fact, in Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, we find that those who had seen the temple built by Solomon, and I don't say Solomon's temple because it was the Lord's temple, those who had seen the temple that was built by Solomon, they said, oh, is this temple after the captivity nothing in comparison with the temple that Solomon built? You see, there were some of the elder statesmen that were still alive that had seen the temple that was built by Solomon. We find in Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. You know, this is uh, actually the basis for the name of the book that Ellen White wrote, The Desire of Ages. So it's speaking about the coming of the desire of all nations. And then God promises, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And then God makes a prediction that the Jews today are still trying to understand. It says in verse 9, The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. The Jews are still waiting for the fulfillment of this prophecy. Because that second temple was nothing compared in glory with the temple that Solomon built. What is meant here by the desire of all nations will come, will fill this temple with glory, and this temple will be greater than the temple that was built by Solomon. Jesus said, one greater than the temple is here. Well, that Shekinah glory is Jesus Christ himself, who came and ministered in that second Jewish temple. Notice John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his what? His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, Jesus Christ himself ministered in that temple. He was the Shekinah glory. 
That's what made the second temple more glorious than the first. But the people rejected the message of Christ. We find this sad story in the Gospels. So Jesus now descends from the east. And he comes to the temple for the last time. The story is in Luke 19, verses 37 and 38. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So now Jesus descends from the east, the Mount of Olives, and he comes through the east gate, through the golden gate, and he enters the temple. Notice Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13. This is going to be his final ministration in the Jewish temple, the second Jewish temple. It says there in Matthew 21, 12 and 13, then Jesus went into the temple of God. Notice the terminology. It was still the temple of God. And drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple. And overturned the tables of the money changers and seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So notice when he enters the temple, it's the temple of God. And Jesus refers to it as my house. Then Jesus tells some parables from chapter 21 through chapter 23. One of those parables was the parable of fig tree. The fig tree was a symbol of Israel. He saw a fig tree in the distance. So he said to his disciples, let's go get something to eat because the fig tree had leaves. And if it had leaves, it was supposed to have fruit. But when he arrives at the fig tree, it has absolutely no fruit. And so Jesus curses the fig tree, a symbol of Israel. It says there in Matthew 21 and verse 18, as well as verse 19, now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. Jesus also told the parable of the vineyard workers. So what was Jesus saying when the fig tree withered and died away? The fig tree was a symbol of the Jewish nation. That is a way in which Jesus was saying that God's plan for the Hebrew theocracy was going to come to an end. And by the way, the Gospel of Mark says that the fig tree was dried up by the roots. And Jesus said, never again will you be the chosen nation to bear the fruit. Now, the parable of vineyard workers is very interesting. It's found in Matthew 21, verse 33 through verse 43. So let's go through this parable of Jesus and see what is the reason for the destruction of Jerusalem for the second time. It says there in verse 33, hear another parable. There was a certain landowner, the landowner is God the Father, who planted a vineyard, the vineyard is um, the world, set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it and built a tower, the tower is the temple, and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dresser, vine dressers, that they might receive its fruit. By the way, these are the messengers that were sent to Israel uh, before the first captivity, before they were taken into Babylonian captivity. So he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. What did they do with these messengers? Well, we already noticed it when we studied about them not paying attention to the prophets and not obeying the Lord's voice. It says, And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. So after the captivity, more messengers are sent out. It says in verse 36, Again he sent out other servants, more than the first. And they did likewise to them. And then notice this, Then, last of all, he sent his son. Who is that son? Jesus. That sounds like, like pretty final. Last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard 
Jesus died outside Jerusalem and killed him. This is the death of Christ. At the hands of his own people. What could be a greater abomination than this? And then we find in verse 40 these words. Therefore, Jesus asked the question, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? Oh, they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. They're pronouncing their own doom, in other words. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in your eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And that nation is the Gentiles. Now the Gentiles will become the way in which God will share the message with the world. The Jewish theocracy came to an end as God's instrument to take the gospel to the world. And then Jesus, we're told in chapter 23, Jesus leaves the temple for the last time. And a very important word is used when he forsakes the temple for the last time when the Shekinah leaves. It says in Matthew 23, and let's just read verse 37 and 38. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. This is talking about the prophets that were sent before the captivity, more prophets after the captivity. Jesus continues, How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under his wings, but you were not willing. And now come the awesome words, See, your house is left unto you desolate. A key word that we've been noticing in Matthew chapter 24. Your house is left desolate. In other words, and then Jesus walks out of the temple. He has abandoned, the Shekinah has abandoned the temple for the last time, and eventually it will lead to the desolation of the city and the people in the year 70 AD. Notice Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. Immediately after leaving the temple, we find these words. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, to them Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And now notice, he, the Shekinah has departed the temple, just like we notice in the book of Ezekiel. Now Jesus leaves the temple desolate, which means that the city is going to be destroyed because they did not know the hour of their visitation. And then where does Jesus sit? He sits on the Mount of Olives, just like the Shekinah before the destruction of Jerusalem in the Old Testament. It says in verse uh, 3, now, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Interesting. So Jesus here is doing exactly what the Shekinah did in the Old Testament. He has come at, to the, as the Shekinah to the temple, by the way, to perform a work of judgment, because after he cleansed the temple, the poor and the maimed and the needy were there in the temple, and all the hypocrites had left. Very, very interesting. You can read this in, in the other Gospels. But anyway, uh, so you see that what happened in the first destruction of Jerusalem also would happen in the second destruction of Jerusalem. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. We're moving now forward to the time when Jerusalem was under siege. And uh, the Roman legions were going to surround the city, and uh, they were at the point where they were going to attack the city. Everything looked like uh, the city was going to fall. And then suddenly, we're going to study this a little more later, suddenly, Cestius and the Roman troops went away from the city. And the Jews who were inside the city, they said, see, God is protecting us. And they went after the Roman legions. Many soldiers in the Roman legions were actually killed. 
but those inside the city who knew what Jesus had said in Matthew chapter 24 said, we've seen the sign. We've seen the sign outside Jerusalem. We've seen the abomination of desolation, the surrounding of Jerusalem by armies, and that is the sign that we are supposed to flee. Let's read Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. Jesus said, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, this is what we read in Daniel chapter 9. The city was going to be restored, the religion was going to be restored, the temple was going to be rebuilt, the Shekinah was going to serve in that temple. We already noticed that. And so clearly, here it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that's what we read from Daniel 9, standing in the holy place, those are the Roman armies, by the way, whoever reads, let him understand. You say, how do we know that this is talking about the Roman legions or the Roman armies? Because the parallel passage in Luke chapter 21 and verse 20 tells us as much. Instead of saying, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, it says in, Matthew, uh, in Luke chapter 21, verse 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. So the city was besieged by the Romans. There was no escape. And so how could uh, God's people see the sign and then flee according to what the next verse says in verse 16 of Matthew 24? Well because the Roman legions left, according to Josephus, for no explainable reason. We know that there was an explainable reason. Jesus himself said that uh, this was going to happen, and when those inside the city saw the sign, they would flee the city, and not one of them would perish. So once again, you have two groups within the city. You have the apostate individuals in the city that will be destroyed by the Romans, and you have, on the other hand, those Christians who were faithful to God that are going to flee from the city before its destruction. Now, what was the reason for the destruction of Jerusalem? Well, in the year 70 AD, a pagan king by the name of Titus came with eagle standards and he just surrounded the city of Jerusalem. This time, there would be no retreat. All of the Christians in the city, the true believers had fled. In the city were only those who were in apostasy, who were living an abominable life. Once again, we're going to find that within the city there was hunger, pestilence, and the sword. And Josephus gives us a very interesting detail. He says that the book of Lamentations was sung as well by the Jews who were being led into captivity after the second destruction of Jerusalem. So Josephus saw a link between the first destruction of Jerusalem and the second destruction of Jerusalem. And it's notable that as Nebuchadnezzar is spoken of as coming like an eagle, and Babylon is compared with a lion with eagle's wings, you have also the Romans coming with their eagle standards. And it's no coincidence that in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 28, it says, For where the eagle is, that where, the, where the bodies are, there will be the eagles as well. It's speaking about the eagles of Rome destroying the city of Jerusalem. Now, why was the city of Jerusalem destroyed? We've already mentioned it. It's because they rejected their Messiah. We find in Luke 19, 41 to 44, a clear description of the reason why the city was destroyed. It says there in Luke 19, verse 41, Now as he drew near, that is, Jesus is drawing near to the city, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. He's saying, I wish you knew how you could experience peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies, speaking about the Roman legions, will build an embankment around you. This is the siege. Surround you and close you in on every side and level you 
and your children within you. Notice, only those within the city. And then it says, Level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. And now is the reason, because you did not know the time of your visitation. The Messiah came, and you did, rec did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own received him not. What could be a greater abomination than that? The rejection of the Messiah. You say, well, we don't reject the Messiah. We're Christians. Yes, but as we noticed in our first presentation, the sin of the Jews and the sin of the Christian world at the end of time is very similar. The Jews rejected Christ, whereas the Christian world is going to reject the law. You say, well, those are two different sins. No, they're not. They're the same sin. How do we explain this? Very simple. The Jews rejected Christ. The world will reject the law, which is a reflection of the character of Christ. So is it okay to reject the reflection of the character of Christ while you claim to serve Christ? Absolutely not. If you love Jesus, you will keep his commandments. His commandments are a reflection of who he is. They describe his character. So you can't, re you can't reject the description of his character and claim that you are serving him. Now, in our next study together, we're going to look at the historical fulfillment of Matthew 24 in the events that led up to the destruction of Jerusalem. We're going to study, Lord willing, Matthew chapter 24, and verses 1 through 14. And we're going to dedicate an entire lecture to the fulfillment of the abomination of desolation, literally with Jerusalem, between the year 66 and the year 70. But in our next study together, we are going to look at the historical fulfillment of Matthew chapter 24 in the events that led up to the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the city itself. So, the first destruction of Jerusalem becomes a pattern for the second destruction of Jerusalem, and both of those destructions become patterns or types or illustrations of what will happen in the world at the end of time with those who claim Christ and those who are true followers of Christ.